everybody. I'm Lisa Vernon. And I'm Justin Trice. Welcome, Welcome to, to Crime of the Arts. A true crime podcast that peeks behind the curtain to shine a light on the dark and untold truths of the creative arts. From film set mysteries to celebrity murders and art heists, these two theater nerds will usher you into the unknown. Unknown. This week, I am going to tell you the story. It's a shamazing story. A shamazing. About a Bravo Liberty. <laughs> Oh Lord! Okay, Bravo, <laughs> Liberty. That could be a lot of mother- that could be a lot of people right mm-hmm. there. But uh, but for the people who know, they know it's Shaw amazing. Shaw-mazing. You'll find out what that means. Okay, because right, as you guys can see right now, for those watching, I I'm like Justin has no the, fucking clue. What does that mean? But she said Bravo, so I mean that's like home to a lot of reality TV. I'm like, mm-hmm, is this some below mm-hmm. the deck thing, or is this? A, there's so many things. Like, uh, who knows what she's gonna tell me? And I watch them all. So <laughs> okay, and this this week I'll be telling y'all about what some call the skylight caper. Ooh. It's a good story, a good heist, eh? And yes, I'm saying a. Eh, a, so because it's it's Canadian, but I guess I was a little harsh on it. Yeah, a boot, a boot. I'm gonna tell you a boot. The oh God, can- your Canadian accent is horrible. I can't. I I yeah. I don't do Canadian, but a boot, poutine, a a. All right, it's dirty clean. Tim Tim and Philip, I can't do that one. Yeah, that's fucking hilarious. But yeah, I'm working already. I'm already. Yeah, it's gonna be a good Canadian tale. And yes, All I, right. I'm not calling it a caper. It was already dubbed that by many. But <laughs> again, that sounds like some shit Canadians would say. I'm- the skylight caper. <laughs> it's uh, when you said a, I was like Australia. That's more like oi. Ooh. That's like oi. Yeah, oi. That's, yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. you're right. But yeah. okay so the story i'm going to tell you is actually about a housewife now there's plenty of drama around the housewives and their legal hoo-ha i was gonna say there's a lot of housewives this is the most relevant big story that's happening in the real world right now so it's about jennifer shaw have you heard about this at all no and i'm i don't know who she is so she is on a newer branch of the Real Housewives and she's on Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Okay. So there's this Ooh. weird this like series because a lot of them are ex-Mormons. I was just about to make that comment Salt yeah. Lake City first thing that's what I was, like, I was like oh it's Mormon that's like the Mormon belt. So the, uh, most of them are ex-Mormons or like have j- recently left the Mormon church and how that like affects their lives is in a whole other layer that other series don't have. I think there's only three seasons of it where, you know, you got like the housewives of Beverly Hills. There's like 52 billion of them. Jennifer Shaw was born October 4th, 1973. And she is a native to Salt Lake City, Utah. She is an American television personality known for her reality TV role on Bravo's The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. And she quickly earned a reputation as the most over the top housewife in SLC. Okay, She managed to fight with literally every single cast member that she had on this show. And one of her biggest battles was with a woman named Mary Cosby. She's no longer on the show. She's a whole nother story. (laughs) But she um, infamously upset Jen Shaw when she told her that she, quote, smelled like a hospital. (laughs) That's so petty. After Jen had visited her aunt who was in like hospice, right? So it's like fucked up to say that. That is pretty fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. So the story with Mary Cosby is she is a preacher in her church. It's a Pentecostal church. And she is a generational preacher in this church. And when her grandmother died, she passed everything on to her granddaughter, okay. including her husband. Oh. Oh. She married no. her no, step grandfather. Yep. She God. married her step grandfather <laughs> and lives in her house. And they all think that she's the new Jesus cometh. Listen, <laughs> it's like I, a whole bunch of controversy. <laughs> I tr- I'm not here to stereotype nor judge any books by its cover. But so far, you have said some things that are just checking those boxes of Salt Lake City. Like, once you said Real Housewife of Salt Lake City, I was like, this could be anything, you know, her just leaving Mormonism and just being a crazy person, polygamy, whatever. So far, you are. I have not been disappointed. I'm, I'm hitting all the marks. You're I know. Everything. I really, I was, <laughs> I was thinking the other night, like if I was to do another podcast, I think I would want to do it on recapping all the Bravo shows that I watch because <laughs> I have so much to fucking say, <laughs> but that's not for you, Justin. That's not your, 
your cup of tea. That would be a whole podcast universe. You'd have to have separate series for each one. I? It's just Can't too- I just like bitch about Bravo? Can't it just be called I bitch guess, about Bravo? I guess you could, but it's just so much content. And you know, there's only going to be specific pe- fans of like one of those shows and they're going to want to listen to like That's Flow Deck true. only. Nope. In my experience, every time I talk about all the shitty reality TV shows I watch, most of them are on Bravo. And everyone's like, oh, you watch Vanderpump? Oh, you watch Summer House? Oh, you watch The Real Housewives? Oh, oh you gosh. watch Bolo Deck? It's all the things. Back to the story. So Mary Cosby <laughs> infamously told Jen Shaw that she smelled like a hospital. And then Jen Shaw called her a grandpa fucker. <laughs> 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 oh, it's such a train wreck. It's glorious. <clears throat> so Bravo viewers met Jen Shaw during season one and that filmed in 2019 and aired in 2020, just in time for the fucking apocalypse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so everyone was at home watching TV anyway. She quickly became like a very polarizing character in the franchise and fans immediately questioned what she did for her job and her need for several assistants. Like you would get the lower third and it'd be like first assistant, third assistant, fifth assistant. And you're like, what the fuck? Who needs as many assistants? (laughs) She referred to them as the Shaw squad. Uh, Is that, is that subtext for cult? (laughs) No. Okay, good. Thank goodness. It's just her unending ego. (laughs) I'll take that. Not long after the production began on season two of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, pretty much it was the same cast. It starred Meredith Brooks, Whitney Rose, Heather Gay, Lisa Barlow, and Mary Cosby and Jen Shaw. So th- okay. those are your, you know, they stand and they all hold their little apple or whatever the fuck in the, you have no idea about any of this. Uh, no, I've seen, I've seen the intro. The opening, they all have like one liners and she's like, life's Shaw amazing she you know yeah. Shaw amazing is like a catch line she just puts Shaw in front of everything Shaw squad Shaw amazing Shaw whatever okay she's real I, fucking original I, I get your title now <laughs> who was she married like uh you know back back in my day when Real Housewives first came on the scene like they were actually like married to real famous people and I use the term real famous people because I see glimpses of other series and now you got all these crazy people that are actually like somehow celebrities then it defected into this just because you're rich and bitchy you get a show and that's kind of what this is okay so Shaw was just rich and bitchy she wasn't yeah she uh, I mean I watched a few documentaries about her since all of this bullshit has come out and she was really like well known in Salt Lake City for being this showy woman filthy rich and whatever and all of these women are rich all of them right but you know what most of them do like one owns a tequila company one owns a beauty place that does like Botox and shit one is a a jeweler you know so you know all of the things that these people do that make money and then when it came to Jen you're like I don't totally understand why she has money like her husband (laughs) is a college basketball coach or football coach so like there's not a lot to be had there i mean it's decent um, money but nothing nothing that's going to be in like 10 million dollar houses i mean if he's in a if he's like a division one college coach though there's there's a lot of money to that she literally calls him coach like everybody calls him coach his name is sharif okay but they call him coach i don't know him what's amazing is i actually watched this show when it started like this isn't coming out of me just learning this stuff (laughs) watched all the episodes (laughs) the worst okay so news broke on march 30th 2021 that shaw and one of her assistants who appeared on the show often with his lower third saying stewart smith first assistant they were arrested Mm. manhattan u.s attorney audrey strauss said in a press release that jennifer shaw who portrays herself as a wealthy and successful business person on reality television And Stuart Smith, who was portrayed as Shaw's first assistant, quote unquote, allegedly generated and sold lead lists of innocent individuals for other members of their scheme to repeatedly scam. (laughs) So in actual reality, the so-called business opportunities pushed on the victims by Shaw and Smith and their co-conspirators were just fraudulent schemes motivated by greed to steal victims money. And these defendants face time in prison for their alleged crimes. Okay, I mean, upwards of. 20, 30 years. This <laughs> is serious, Damn. serious stuff. HSI, it's, it's like a division of Department of Homeland Security that does investigating in situations like this. Special agent in charge, Peter C. Fitzhugh, <laughs> claimed that Shaw and Smith built their opulent lifestyle at the expense of vulnerable, often elderly working class people. 
in layman's terms, they they had a telemarketing scam by yep. convincing victims to purchase so-called business services, lying about how the services would help these people generate money and then continuing to pressure them in, to purchase additional business services, leaving many victims in debt at the end of it. Like they're already struggling financially. A lot of them are elderly. Taking advantage of them. Yeah. So they objectified very real human victims as leads. And right. They bought and sold them, offering their personal information for sale to other members of their fraud ring. So they're not the only ones involved. They have their location in Salt Lake City. And then there's all over the country, these groups. It's almost like an MLM. (laughs) That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So we all know about what these other women do. And on one of the reunions... Andy Cohen, who, you know, is the mastermind of all these celebrity bra- 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 Bravo shows. He's like, Jen, what what is your job? You know, like, what exactly is it that you do? And she can't, like, give you a straight answer. So this is a quote, quote from the show. I own three different marketing companies and we do lead generation, data monetization, customer acquisition. Yeah. Someone taught her big words. The best way to describe this is I'm the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I'm the one behind the curtain that no one knows exists, but I'm the one making everything happen. <laughs> so ads are popping up to you guys and they're like, how the hell do they know I'm shopping at Neiman Marcus? That's me. If you think about it, you know how much traffic is on the internet every second. All the people clicking, I'm making money on every click. Anytime you click on anything, I'm getting some money. I think because I've been blessed to be successful with my marketing background and my companies, I've really found a niche with a direct response marketing world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been able to branch out and invest in our fashion company, our skincare line, and our lash line. <laughs> and according to a press release, Sean Smith's alleged involvement in the scheme stems back all the way back, all the way to 2012. So they've been doing Damn, this for they've over been doing a decade. That for, yeah, for 10, year, 10, 11 years at this point. <sighs> and while they were indicted in March of 21, the cases that they're being held against are back to 2019. Okay. And 10 other people who were previously charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud and connections with the telemarketing scheme. So there's 12 of them all together within her little Uzi Watt. The lead up to Shaw's arrest by members of Homeland Security and the NYPD appeared in an episode of season two. <laughs> so let me set the scene. Anything for watched, ratings. Yeah. Yo, I don't. Okay. So no. No, they didn't know this was going to fucking happen. This was like a magic miracle for Bravo and horrible for everyone else. (laughs) The women, the cast of this show, are all sitting in like a sprinter van, like a party van, you know, and they're waiting to go on a trip. They're going to road trip together to Vail, Colorado. They arrive in the parking lot of where that beauty salon is that one of the women own. Okay. And they're kind of like showing up piecemeal, like one at a time. It was funny because they're like all showing up and their husbands are dropping them off and they have like 56 Louis Vuitton, you know, luggages <laughs> and they got to shove it all in this, this van. And most of the women were there. I think, what did I say? There were six women. Four mm-hmm. of them were already on the bus when Jen came. Or no, three. Jen was the fourth. Jen shows up and is sitting in the van with four of the six women. And in the moments before she was taken into custody, she receives a phone call. She told her castmates when she hung up the phone that she was unable to go on the trip with them to Vail because her husband was suffering from a medical emergency and she needed to get to the hospital right now. Mm, good excuse. So the the production is like, what is going on? And the, all the women are all upset because they all know her husband. And on the show, you see her take the phone call and you see her face be like... You can see it's written all over her face. She looks at her castmate, who's also her best friend, and she's like, I have some bad news. I just got a call, and Sharif Sr. is in the hospital. He has internal bleeding, so I need to go. Is that how I would come to you and be like, my husband's in the hospital? Nope. (laughs) Nope. Sure isn't. (laughs) So then after telling Heather that the doctors weren't sure, quote unquote, if they're going to need to do surgery, she shared the bad news with the other women who were on the bus as she was getting ready to leave. And... She gets her mic off and she just pieces out in like a, you know, a escalator or something picks her up. Yeah. 15 minutes later, all the women are in the bus, like all very upset. Half of them are crying. Production is like all over it because it's like this unearthed drama. <laughs> you know, you feel like so much of it is is staged and maybe it is. But this is one of those things that they were like, what the fuck? This is beautiful. We didn't make this. This is we, great. We didn't have to orchestrate this. Yeah. It's just right here in yeah. our lap. <laughs> yeah. Get the camera zoomed into Tina. Get the camera zoomed into so-and-so. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Fast forward 15 minutes. 
and authorities all pull in in unmarked cars and surround the fucking van and roll up on these unsuspecting emotional women. (laughs) (laughs) And they are surrounded by people in DHS and NYPD bulletproof vests saying, where is Jen Shaw? Wow. And the whole cast and the production team is like, what the fuck is going on? They're like, oh, is she pranking us? Is this a prank? She's pranking us, right? Like, this isn't real. And they find out that it's real. Production's like, we don't know anything about this. Like, this is... (laughs) This is not a part of what we do. Like, this is, we're just here to, for the first time ever, watch something just happen. (laughs) We're just here to film. Right. My goodness. So they're in the bus talking to each other, all the women. And they're like, well, what the fuck is going on? And they're like, other than our families, a whole of like seven people knew they were meeting in that parking lot. So who could have possibly turned Jen in to say that she was going to be at that place? You know, it's like suspicious. I mean, DEA and all of that could have been watching her a long time. My thing, like these women probably weren't thinking like a little too far. They probably had her fucking phones tapped years ago. Mm -hmm. They started pointing the finger at each other. Oh, you told, you told, you told. (laughs) Whitney Rose was quoted saying, I don't know anything, but I have a lot of questions around what Jen's lifestyle is. It intrigues me where she gets all of her money and all of the stuff that she has. And Meredith Marks was on a FaceTime call with the cast and she said, I'm not surprised by the arrest. That's how if you watch the show, you know, she has so much Botox that her face doesn't move. Mm. She's very pretty until she talks and you're like, oh, what? What's weird? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, She said too many things didn't add up and I suspected that something was going on for a while. And now it's validated that I was right, that I'm not crazy. And that's the bottom line. Mm. And it should be noted that part of the drama, like I said, is that the castmates decided to point fingers at each other. But part of that is bred from the fact that two of the six castmates decided not to take the bus with them on short notice. So two. Oh, yeah. So so you're like, what did you know? One of them was working undercover (laughs) to uh, alleviate their own crimes. That's what that sounds like. Imagine. So... (laughs) Meredith Marks and Mary Cosby were the two who were not on the bus. So Meredith, her father had just passed away and she was actually already in Colorado days before for her father's memorial service or something. Right. Mary, however, was just like, fuck these bitches. I'm going to take a plane. (laughs) So (laughs) the cops eventually caught up with Jen Shaw in her vehicle that she left in 15 minutes before they arrived and arrested her on the side of the fucking road in Utah. (laughs) the one thing that they didn't really talk about in the articles i was reading but i just know from watching the show for a disclaimer her husband is an african-american man she has two sons and she is a polynesian descent so everyone is a minority in this picture and the thing that they didn't talk about is the way that the police handled her two young sons when they issued the search warrant like these kids are like 16 and 13 or something they're minors okay they fucking took them out of the house at gunpoint, hands up, handcuff them, put them on the floor. And I'm like, what the fuck? You're issuing a search warrant, fine. But this is a white collar crime to a family home. This is She's not like a murdering drug dealer that you would feel threatened. Right. You know, I, I, I just don't understand. Had they been a bunch of uh, white family or white women or girl, whatever, none of that would have happened. None of it would have escalated to the place that it did. They wouldn't have taken a bunch of white girls and put them in handcuffs and, and put them on the floor. Yeah. Right? It's bullshit. Makes me so angry. <laughs> As if these kids aren't going to be traumatized enough by getting their house searched by the fucking DHS and NYPD while they're in Utah. And their mom's <laughs> possibly going to jail and her mom's being arrested. It's just a lie. It's all traumatic. I like, how do you... <laughs> I just don't know how you get past that. So, yeah, it's just awful. And, and there's a lot of pieces to all of this... I unfortunately don't have a ton of information about the victims of her crime, but some of the victims of this whole scenario is her family. Like her husband and her two boys really, she just upheaves their whole lives because she's an asshole. It's crazy. So Shaw was arrested that day and booked on conspiracy to commit wire fraud in connection with telemarketing and conspiracy to commit money laundering. Both the Bravo star and her assistant, Stuart, faced a maximum sentence of 30 years for the wire fraud charges and an additional 20 for the years for money laundering charges. And I mean, they're in their 40s? I was just about to ask you how old they were. 
What what year did I say she was born? Do you remember? I, I do oh, not. Scroll back up. Hold on. I, 73. Oh, 73. Yeah. yeah they're, okay. Oh, they're in their mm-hmm, late 40s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's okay. most of the rest of your life, you know? Damn. Following her arrest, she appeared before a Utah judge in March of 2021. And the judge set the following conditions for her and Smith. They must commit no federal offense upon being released. They must appear as required. They may not travel outside of Utah with the exception of the New York City court. No international travel, no contact with co-defendants, and no engagement in telemarketing. And they were subsequently seen leaving the Utah court and ignoring all the reporters' questions as they headed to their cars. Shaw called into her hearing on April 2nd of 2021 because COVID. So she had to video call and pled not guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and connection to telemarketing and one kind of conspiracy to commit money laundering. And she saw counsel from her local Utah lawyer named Clayton Sims and from known white collar crime defense attorney, Henry Aspill, who works out of DC. And the government described the scandal as a $5 million money laundering scheme. Damn. That's a lot. Of five, million. five million over <laughs> amassed over a lot of years. I mean, that's still a lot. Mm-hmm. And that you you did that to tons and tons of people. Well, it takes a lot to you know these, yeah. th- to think that you're getting five million dollars from individuals. Exactly, that's a lot of individuals who you know are probably paying you ten max, probably ten thousand dollars every time. You screwed over. You you messed up a lot of lives to get that. So during the April 21 hearing, the judge set Jen Shaw's bail at $1 million, giving her one week to pay the required $250,000 to secure the bond in cash or property. Mm. And her lawyer asked for two weeks to secure the bond, which the judge approved, but noted that Shaw must sign the $1 million personal recognizance bond by the end of that day. Other conditions of her bail included no drug use or excessive alcohol, not being allowed to open any bank accounts, and continued mental health treatments, which I found so great. But they actually offered mental health. Rarely happens. Right. So the Bravo Stars attorney told the court that Shaw doesn't own her home, which was labeled as Jen's chalet on the show in the lower third. And she didn't own any real property. The government also alleged that she was not willingly disclosing her assets amid the investigation. And there's a documentary on Hulu that I watched when all of this first happened. It came out real fucking fast. And (laughs) (laughs) they interviewed people who know her in Salt Lake City. And this one guy got on there and I think he was like a fashion designer. He had designed dresses for her or something. And he talked about all the shit in her closet. (laughs) She didn't own any of it. All the designer bags and shoes and all the things you saw in there were rented and borrowed and fake. No, it's all a fucking facade. She doesn't own shit. All that money to pretend that you're rich. Mm. Well, she's got real cars. You know, you can't fake that. You got rental <laughs> properties, but you don't actually own any equity in any of it. I mean, you're like piss rich. You know, <laughs> you have nothing. So... She doesn't really have anything to liquidate to get this money for her bail. She doesn't even have probably a million actual dollars to keep herself out of jail. Oh, definitely not. She probably just has like a few thousand, maybe a Mm -hmm. couple hundred just laying around somewhere, if that much. So she filed a motion to dismiss her case. But it was denied, of course, because that's ridiculous. And additionally, her attorney, his name was Daniel R. Alonzo, along with his colleagues, Henry A. Basile, who we talked about being like a really high end white collar crime lawyer. And Michael Chum announced that they resign from helping her through this case. So she had to retain a new attorney to represent her in the case moving forward, according to court documents. So her attorneys were like, fuck this. This is not good. And we're out. So November 2021. I'm not going to say his name right, but I'm going to try. Joseph Ciccio. I'm going to say Ciccio. (laughs) Caccio one of the 10 that were also charged along with her. He was charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud in connection to telemarketing in 2019 and was sentenced to time served. According to his attorney, he received that sentence because he was recently in a car accident that left him a paraplegic. Mm. Karma's a bitch. They were like, that's enough of a sentence. 
So the judge was very compassionate about it and did not follow the government's recommendation and sentenced him below whatever the guidelines were. Stuart Smith, the assistant who was arrested and charged with Shaw, changed his plea in November 2021 after initially pleading not guilty. He pled guilty to three counts, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, money laundering, and obstruction of justice. And he admitted to hiding ownership and money, defrauding elderly people, and lying to the Federal Trade Commission in a deposition, which constituted perjury. Oh, boy. He faced a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. Damn. So nearly a month after Stewart changed his plea to guilty, another co-defendant in the case changed his plea as well. Shane Hanna, who is one of the other 10, was also charged in connection back in 2019. That person entered a guilty plea after previously pleading not guilty as well. And Hanna pled guilty to eight counts of superseding information to wire fraud conspiracy, money laundering, device access fraud, aggravated identity theft, false statements on loan applications, and wire fraud. So this was clearly a That's plea crazy. bargain deal that could yeah. have really negatively affected Jen Shaw. I think they really were just like, we got all 10 of you, but give me the head honcho, right? Gunning for her. So these charges were much more severe than Stewart's and had a mandatory minimum on the aggravated identity theft, which was a two to five year minimum. Mm -hmm. I read when I looked it up, it had both. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. How do you have two low numbers? Whatever. (laughs) So (laughs) not a lawyer (laughs) following the release of a documentary called The Housewife and the Shaw Shocker. Uh, It was put out by ABC (laughs) News. Yeah, (laughs) the Shaw everything. Um, It explored Jen Shaw's legal issues with interviews from alleged victims and government agents. Could you fucking imagine? So the Bravo personality requested that her charges be dismissed again. And her legal team claimed that ABC News documentary would ruin her chances at an unbiased jury pool because everyone could access that ahead of her trial. Mm Mm-hmm. And the U.S. attorney responded to the motion stating that there was no basis to drop the legal case to which Shaw's attorney called out the government officials that participated (laughs) in the Hulu documentary, saying, make no mistake, the government cannot shift the blame on Hulu or ABC News for the manner in which the final program was edited. The government and its agents publicly expressed their opinions to the press about a pending case. Therefore, the government is fully accountable for all that followed. Like any wrongdoer, the government is entirely responsible for the entire damage caused by its violation of the rules. And they're right. They are right in I that think regard. That's valid. Yeah. It's not like this is over and then they did these interviews. This is an open case. No, it was happening in the moment and they were like, we're going to discuss it. Yeah. You never fucking see that. If any regular person, like a part of the jury would have had a discussion and they would have had to like, you know, get rid of the whole jury and redo everything. And And listen, everyone was sitting on their couch watching these fucking Hulu (laughs) documentaries during COVID, right? You know, yeah. There wasn't enough content to keep us (laughs) sane. (laughs) So you watched anything. So even though I think they have a valid point in that the government shouldn't have done those interviews, she still did what she did. And the judge agrees with my, like, my opinion fucking matters. But Judge Sidney (laughs) H. Stein denied her request. So after documenting the arrests and the aftermath on season two of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, Jen Shaw fucking returned to season three. (laughs) And began production in the winter of 2022. The audacity of this person. Well, she needed the money after all of that. (laughs) So, so that's what I think too. She was like, I don't make any money doing anything now. I have to do this show. But it's insane. And it's so hard because if you watch the show, she's like a really volatile person. Like she's very toxic. She's an emotional disaster. In that Hulu doc, they talk about how she would like scream at her employees at the top of her lungs all the time. And I could see it. I don't think that they're lying because she does it on fucking national television. They were like, we don't have to embellish this at all. Actually, they're like, Just show the stuff. A (laughs) hundred percent. She's part of the reason, in my opinion, that they even got that show in Salt Lake City because the rest of them are not nearly as interesting as she is. Mm. Honestly, 
She's explosive. She's throwing her fucking drinks. She's screaming at people. And then she's crying her eyes out and remorseful. And she's just like a disaster. (laughs) And then if you watch the show, you meet her husband and her kids and you meet her whole family. And her husband is like a complete polar opposite of who she is on the face or whatever she's portraying. And I just don't think she's that good of an actress. Like, I think most of this is real. Okay. Whether the scenarios are kind of designed to make her show herself is one thing, but I think this is who she is. So her husband is like (laughs) soft-spoken. He's generally a happy person. He's very compassionate and empathetic. And she's like, her hair's on fire all the time. She's like at a hundred. Um, and the kids, the kids seem so sweet and loving. And it must be so hard because the dad coach is, he's away all the time for work because he's, you know, a coach and they travel. So the kids um, are stuck with their mom. And the kids are stuck with their mom. <laughs> and their mom's a fucking reality TV star. You know, it's gotta be difficult. It's just gotta be difficult for them no matter money doesn't fix problems mm-hmm. <laughs> you know Ugh. so here's the ironic thing Uh-oh. jen shaw's attorneys filed a motion to keep the clips from the real housewives out of the court case but here she is filming season three <laughs> They, they argued that any use of clips from the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City at the trial of Ms. Shaw, either in the government's case in chief or during cross-examination of the defense's case, would have to fall under one of the exceptions to the hearsay rule of evidence. As it's not something that's said in court. This is something that was said outside of the court, so it's considered hearsay. Right. The defense also submitted nearly 40 questions for the potential jury, including multiple queries about their prospective jurors' knowledge of the TV show. <laughs> and her her attorneys argued that The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City is a show that is deliberately edited and Hollywood fabricated fantasy loosely based on real people and designed to draw millions of viewers into outrageous episodes manufactured by editors. The <laughs> clips are devoid of evidentiary value as they do not relate to any material facts at issue in Mrs. Shaw's case. Damn. Valid. That's true. It's another true statement. What do you think about that? Do you think that they should be able to use stuff from the show? Uh, I personally feel they should be allowed to use, I would say, within the first and second season footage if they deem it can help create the timeline for the accused crimes. Like they can use it as breadcrumbs. That's what I that's what I feel Mm. on that. Do I feel they can directly use things that are said within the episode? Not necessarily. But like I said, that whole breadcrumb effect, it's like, well, she stated we have, you know, they could be like, we have bank reports that she transferred all of this money on this date. And here on this date on the show, she happened to say she was going to be away for a while, whatever the case might be. Right, right, right. right. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Here's the thing. I think I brought this up in a previous episode a long time ago, but- Andy Cohen is a genius. The guy behind all this stuff. He's got what well, watch what happens live or whatever. Yeah. And he's like the executive producer for all these shows. And they'll sit you down and they will interview you. And one of the questions they ask you is like, you got anything in your closet that we need to know about? <laughs> you know, like is there skeletons in your closet? And this bitch knew before. I mean, they started filming her show the year that people were being charged. And she must have been contractually obligated to continue at least the first season. But she knew she was doing illegal shit. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and to Bravo, it's it's gold. You know, there's no reason for them to go in and like speculate and pick out things that her their castmates are doing illegally because it doesn't matter to them. They're not involved. Right. They're just but, here to observe. But to Shaw, she's like, the longer I stay on here, the more clout or credibility I get to use towards scamming people out of their money. Mm -hmm. So this is a calculated move. I think it's also, she's just, she got lost to her ego. Really? She lost her whole life to her ego. She wanted to be important. You know, she wanted to be seen on TV as this rich woman. She's got all this fake shit, this house. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Let me get back on script here. During season three, Premiered in September of 22, Jen continually, all season, maintained that she was innocent. 
And she said, I would be lying if I said I wasn't scared. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about my family. And I can't imagine being away from them. It would literally kill me. And it's horrible. She talks about how she won't see her son go to prom or get married or whatever because she's looking at 30 years in prison, right? That's what they're telling her. And she also noted that she and her family downsized to a house that was only 4,500 square feet, Justin. Their old house was 9,000 square feet. Oh, my gosh. Before, 4,500 square feet is still an insane amount. And out there, I'm sure that's very pricey. Justin, 4,500 <laughs> square feet. My last apartment was 500 square feet. <laughs> that's 4,000 more square feet than I had. That's insane. <laughs> Oh my god! It's just like get a fucking grip, you know? Like that's so crazy. She's just like, "Woe is me! I have to live <sighs> like a peasant." I must trade in my Bentley for a Mercedes. Instead of my twenty million dollar home, I'm only in a one point five million dollar home. <laughs> 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 so she joked on the show that she went from Barbie's dream closet to a normal closet, and that she also had to downsize her Shaw squad. She's so far out of touch, she doesn't even know what a regular closet is. <laughs> right. In a 4,000 square foot home, you ain't got a regular closet, bitch. We ain't all sitting in 4,000 <laughs> square foot homes. <laughs> so in December 2022, just a few months ago, there was a full article on page six. And it reported the authorities discovered more than 50 counterfeit designer items in Jen's home when they raided her property following her arrest. <laughs> And according to court documents, items included fake Chanel and Louis Vuitton handbags, faux Cartier, Bulgari, and Dior accessories. And the items, which also included some real designer wares, were seized so that Jen would have the assets to possibly pay back any restitution that came from whatever her case was. (laughs) So Jen confirmed that she's going to be skipping the reunion for season three. I don't blame her. Fuck (laughs) that. (laughs) She claimed that her lawyers advised her not to discuss the case on the show. And she said it was clear with Bravo that out of respect for the courts and standing judicial order, I would not be in a position to discuss anything related to my legal case or sentencing. Bravo found that to be unsatisfactory and said they expected to discuss the storyline. And that expectation has no regard for her or her family's well-being. And under legal advice, she will not be attending the reunion and needs to focus more importantly on the things in life that matter like her family. So after an entire season and many filmed conversations where she cried innocence for all of these charges, July 11th of 2022, she finally had her day in court and she changed her plea. As part of a plea deal, Jen Shaw pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and agreed to forfeit six and a half million dollars of proceeds that were traceable to the conspiracy and to pay nine and a half million in restitution. The charge of money laundering was dropped for her to take the plea deal. Okay. In court, she stated, I knew this was wrong. I knew people were harmed and I am so sorry. And because she pled guilty, there will be no trial and they're going to go straight to sentencing. And in the show, literally just like just aired maybe two weeks ago, you see them go to New York and two of the castmates go there with her. And just in the hours before she was going into court to fucking plead guilty, she's saying she didn't do it. <laughs> it's nuts. Oh my it's goodness. nuts. They're like in their hotel, like having cookies and shit, like trying to comfort her. And then the next morning she gets up and goes and says, I did it. I'm so sorry. It's fucking nuts. It's crazy. So Sharif Shaw, her husband, coach, married Jen Shaw in 94. Mm-hmm. They've been married for a long time. And he wrote an emotional statement to the court on her behalf before her sentencing. According to court documents, Sharif claimed that Jen has genuine remorse for her involvement in the telemarketing scheme and asked for the judge to show leniency in the final ruling. And he wrote, Jen has never been arrested or detained for any crime. My wife's current legal predicament was caused by a confluence of events that came together at various points, which caused her to spiral out of control. Mm. Because of my absence, I was not able to see how badly my wife was suffering. As I think about it now, I saw her spending more time in our bedroom alone. She often slept in our children's bed, waiting me to get home. And she would constantly tell me that she feels so alone. 
this poor man is taking like onus of her yeah, bullshit. Yeah, when he he doesn't need to. And in the show, which wasn't in any of the articles, I just know from watching, her father had passed away at some point before the show started. And she would say to him that she feels alone or whatever, like he was gone too much and she was depressed. Then that didn't happen a decade ago. That happened just before the show started. Well, my thing is like, so you're depressed and you're feeling lonely. And I understand where you're coming from with that. What does that have to do with stealing grandma's money? Exactly. This isn't this isn't like you said, I'm feeling alone. I'm feeling lonely. I'm not feeling seen. And I started fucking the gardener. Like, you're not saying any of that. You're right. You're saying... You decided to take that loneliness and orchestrate wire fraud slash money laundering. I feel lonely, so I'm going to prey on loneliness of other people, which is the elderly, and take their money. It's just this poor man. I just feel horrible for him. She was sentenced on January 6, 2023. That just happened. What's today? The 16th. It was 10 days ago she was sentenced. So in the weeks before her sentencing, the U.S. government recommended Shaw be sentenced to 10 years in prison, calling the reality star the most culpable person in this case and alleging her belated expressions of remorse ring hollow. And they fucking do. Mm-hmm. You can't walk around for years saying you're innocent. These people are turning on you. How could they? You fed them and kept their kids in school and all this shit. And then you turn around, you knew this is all happening, really? And you've just been lying? And yet she only got 10, though. They still were lenient. Well, that's not what she got sentenced with. That's what the the U.S. Attorney's Office was recommending to the court. And ahead of her final sentencing, several victims addressed the judge in impact statements and Oof. asked that the punishment fit the crime. One person claimed they lost more than $100,000 and had to remortgage their home, adding that their marriage nearly ended in divorce because of the financial fallout. Multiple victims claimed they considered suicide after spending thousands of dollars on fraudulent tutorial courses. That's what they called them. They were quoted saying, your sanity is in doubt and your confidence is eroded. Your independence, what limited amount there is, curbed. And you can't trust anybody. You're not the same person you were before this experience. Whoever these telemarketers are should cease stealing money and repay what they have stolen and perform acts of restitution, such as living as we are, doing what we're doing with the limited resources we have. That really would be very interesting. (laughs) Yeah. To force these very rich people who have stolen millions of dollars to live as the people they were stealing from. It would be an eye opener. So she was officially sentenced 10 days ago to six and a half years in prison and five years of supervised release. The judge ordered her to surrender herself on February 17th. And she was quoted to say, I am sorry. My actions have hurt innocent people. And I want to apologize by saying I'm doing all I can to earn the funds to pay restitution. After Shaw's sentencing, her lawyers have requested she report to a minimum security facility in Texas. So that's where she's going to be in jail for six and a half years. Honestly, I thought once you mentioned impact letters and everything else, I Mm -hmm. thought the sentencing was going to be harsher. But in a way, it was even lighter because you did you have to do six and a half in prison and then the five just supervision like she's going to be on probation. Right. That's the yeah. part of the five years. And one of the caveats they put in there is that she has to continue seeking mental health care and has to take drugs for her mental health as long as a doctor deems necessary. Like there is a whole bunch of mental health bullet points in her sentencing. OK, which is awesome. That's something that seems to be overlooked many times in the criminal justice system. We rarely get that. Yep. Like she talks about on the show at one point how she actually attempted suicide after Mm. she was arrested. It came out in a really ugly way because the show was really ugly. But it's a real thing that I'm glad that they're addressing her mental health because that is a real something she's really suffering with. Depression looks like it's been a part of her life for a long time. I just really kudos to the judges who did that. While the premiere of season three showed Jen getting very close to some of the castmates, Meredith, Whitney, and Lisa went on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen and said that they hadn't spoken to Jen since she changed her plea in 2022. Now, Meredith and Heather were the two people who went all the way to New York to be with her the hours before she she changed her plea. And they said it was shocking and they didn't see it coming and they really thought that she was going to fight till the end of it. But yeah, I mean, if you watch the images that they took of her leaving the court after her sentencing, Sharif is like 10 fucking miles in front of her. I don't know if they're going to make it, but he was very involved. 
in her whole court. You know, they speculated on the show after the sentencing that she changed her plea because they were reading all of the statements from the witnesses that were yeah. now going against her and the victims. And it was unfucking deniable that she there was just no way she couldn't talk her way out of it. And then it said that she probably pled guilty because Stuart Smith, her assistant, was going to get on the stand and spill the fucking beans against her. This is speculation. <laughs> but I bet that Sharif was gone for so long <laughs> and he was so busy in his own world and his job that he didn't see. So he didn't look at his wife ever and be like, where's all this coming from? How are we getting all of these things? And when he finally did figure it out, he was like, what the fuck are we doing here? I, I'm, I'll be very interested to see if he'll last six and a half years. He might just be that kind of a man that he's just going to stand by his woman, mm -hmm. take care of his family. But she ruined their lives, essentially. Yeah, I'm actually impressed he had nothing to do with it because I was waiting to see how that would like merge, you what? know. <laughs> But no, that that was wild. Again, I don't watch Real Housewives. So naturally, when you're like, it's a real housewife, I'm just like, is it like Lisa Rinna? Or is it like, who who is it exactly? Like, yeah. uh, I just needed to know. But yeah, that Jen was crazy. Shaw. Jen Shaw. I'm going to have to look her up later. <laughs> Jen Wait, Shaw. Wait, do you see her? <laughs> oh, boy. Her appearance matches the. Sure does. OK. All right. <laughs> sure does. She wears feathers and fur and she's ridiculous. <laughs> and she's got 10 people there to do her fucking hair and makeup, but she's late to everything. And you're like, dude, you're not going. Anywhere. You're going to dinner in the backyard. Like, what the so, fuck? Like, this is more like a philosophical question here. You know, like, the what came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh -huh. Like, in this scenario, what came first? Was it Meryl Streep's performance in The Devil's Wear Prada? <laughs> or is it people like this existed, which inspired her role in the that second movie one. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm seeing too much of that now. Yeah, and I just it's second one, dude. I'm telling okay. you. Okay. All right. It's all based in reality. Those people just exist in the universe. <laughs> all right. <laughs> they really do. It's crazy. Crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy. Let me introduce you to a few new friends of ours. And I hear them call me by by my name so i run into the kitchen to check and there's nobody there and i start to like hear like my closet door start to open oh hell no like, oh, my God. Inside. oh hell no all of a sudden for no reason i woke up in the middle of the night like my eyes just snapped open and it's that strange feeling that you have when something wakes you up you and you don't know what has woken you up until you either see what it was or you hear whatever it was if you like all things spooky, check out a Spooky Tales. We, Christina and MJ, talk about all things spooky like haunted places, myths and legends with a focus on Latin America. New episodes every Friday. Listen in your favorite podcast apps as well as SpookyTales.com. All right. Tell me about a skylight caper is that what you said skylight caper yep that okay. is what i said it's a it's an age-old canadian make an appearance <laughs> because i would love to see him in this <laughs> no no i mean maybe he might say one or two things but no no real appearance <laughs> so yes uh my story some people call it the skylight caper other people call it the montreal museum of fine arts robbery whatever you choose to call this it is known in Canada as the largest Canadian art heist in existence. I think art heists are officially your thing. <laughs> For now. No, but I think that like you just need to do the art heists. I won't even <laughs> touch them. They'll just be Justin stories. <laughs> just leave them alone. So this incident here, like I said, it's the largest in history for them. But even saying that, you know, everyone always says something is the largest in history, but this museum had a past history of other attempts and i'm gonna get into that too as well as the main story here so okay. <laughs> it just it blew my mind because usually when when i'm looking at art heist you know it's just a definitive incident that happened i'm not over here going you don't normally see like oh five or six other times something might have attempted to happen and didn't but so let's get into it like i said this is one of the i should top this off with one of the greatest unsolved art heist also 
within Canadian oh. history. It's the biggest art heist in Canadian history. It is also one of the greatest unsolved. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. little backstory. The Montreal Museum of Fine Arts was founded as the Art Association of Montreal in eight, April 1860 by Anglican Bishop of Montreal at the time, who was Francis Fulford, to promote appreciation of the fine arts among the people in the city. However, there's always a however. It did not start <laughs> to exhibit any of its artwork until the 1870s and going into the 1880s when the wealthy patrons of Montreal who rose to fame during Canada's industrialization era uh, started to donate money and artwork to the association. So the main building where the museum stands today was built in 1913 in the historic Golden Square Mile neighborhood of the city where the most wealthiest and successful families lived. Don't you uh, love them? You yeah. have like eight mile and the Golden Square Mile. <laughs> and the Golden Square Mile. Come on down to the Golden Square Mile. Steer clear of the oh. eight mile. The museum itself is considered today as one of the largest art museums in Canada by gallery space and also the oldest museum in Canada. So... Prior to the infamous skylight caper that I'm going to talk about, there had already been a few attempted heists at the very same museum. That were unsuccessful? <laughs> attempted? Like they didn't. Uh, attempted. Okay. Some might be unsuccessful. Some. Okay. <laughs> well, you're about to find out. Okay. 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 I'm gonna keep my pants this on. Isn't, this isn't even my main story yet. But one night in 1933. There was a robber who hid in the museum overnight and then he oh took 14 paintings and he passed them out of an open window in a women's bathroom to his accomplice. Later on, <laughs> the museum received a ransom note from the thieves asking for $10,000, which was a lot of money back in 1933. People, sure was. You know, they were asked for that money. They were like, please give us $10,000. Or we're going to rip up some of these paintings. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not that we're just going to keep them. We're going to rip them up. <laughs> the museum did not comply at first. So the thieves sent them a returned painting, but it was ripped in half three months later. <laughs> they sent it to them three months later. It was ripped in half like, because they didn't hmm. comply. So what do we just cut a finger out of this painting? <laughs> yeah, no, they straight up just a finger. <laughs> you know, I, I can imagine the manager of the museum one day, you know, the guards like we have a package and he's like, could this be a painting? And then he just opens it. It's ripped in half. Oh <laughs> he's screaming. Um, <gasps> yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, call one. the Pinkertons and the bank tellers or whoever we need. <laughs> So, yeah, that happened three months later. They didn't comply. However, the stolen paintings were eventually recovered when the thief, Paul Thuin, was arrested after stealing a a rail freight car and told the police where he had buried the paintings. He buried them in the ground? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He, the thing is, he got arrested for the whole other thing with the rail freight car. And then he told the police where he had buried the paintings before he committed suicide while in police custody by poisoning himself so that he wouldn't have to stand trial for the crime of oh the freight God. car. And now the paintings. What did he have, like the blue pill in his pocket to Bad off himself? No, 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 no blue pill, no blue pill. But I don't even know how he smuggled that poison in. But um hmm. So that was the first attempt on this place. Then there was also another attempt in 1960 when a gang of armed robbers tried to force their way into the museum to to steal uh, some of the Van Gogh paintings during a special exhibition. So the thieves were quickly foiled, if you will, by the local authorities and guards at the museum, but they were able to escape before being caught. Okay, with nothing. They get shit. They got shit. They got shit. To this day, they've never been identified. No one knows whether they've ever tried to make another attempt or not at the museum. So they went in to steal shit like a whole gang of them. They got caught. They almost got "Ah!" they almost got arrested (laughs) on the spot and they ran away. Nothing taken. Oh, my God. I mean, so. what are the chances you think that the same people who were thwarted <laughs> in that one is the one who's doing your your actual story? For me, it's a possibility. OK, OK. Because I, the, I told you this attempt was in 1960. 
that happened 12 years before my incident, which is the skylight okay. caper. So, yeah, fast forward 12 years later, 72, you know, essentially that's when the skylight caper ha- had happened. Um, but let's get Are into you gonna that. Tell me that they like Mission Impossible in, in a skylight. Like Tom Cruise just boom, 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 came down with a rope around his waist and lowered in. Possibly anything can happen oh in gosh. this world. I listen. Jesus. My last story, I told you he put acid on the nails and let it soak. I don't <laughs> on the window. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was hopping around buildings. So I, anything can happen right now. <laughs> Spider Man, Skylight Capers. I mean, listen, <laughs> we give a lot of like shitty names to serial killers, but I feel like people who are stealing shit from museums deserve to have these like fun names. It's more orchestrated. Well, yeah. I mean, it's right? just, yeah. A little theatrical, all of it. It's theatrical. <laughs> Planning, oh, my goodness. Cursing. <laughs> so now we're going to get to this infamous Skylight Caper. And. To paint the picture, to set the tone already, we're giving you a little atmosphere. The Skylight Caper heist happens on Labor Day weekend of 1972. It's always something (laughs) like that where everyone's fucking distracted. Yep. so, So you already know what that means. There were several events happening simultaneously. Fireworks. Yeah, everything was going on. Drinking. Parades. All of this stuff was occurring that made the museum a lot more vulnerable than usual. And the board president, director, and the director of security were all out on vacation in either Mexico (laughs) or the U.S. that weekend. Because, you know, Labor Day in America is a big thing, Mm -hmm. touristy-wise, everything else. But, yeah, they were all in these different places for vacations. Okay. (laughs) They were not around for any of this. Not Uh, even in the country. Not even in the country. Only leaving the director of public relations there, Bill Bantley, as the most senior official left in charge of security. Which is not the guy. (laughs) Definitely not. (laughs) This is why I always put all these fucking details in public relations. He was the director of public he's relations. He's a people pleaser. Yeah. We, he's not your source of security, nor is he your source of protection, folks. Like this was. Right. Wow. Ouch. <laughs> okay. Go. So, yeah, he was left in charge of the security. Based on his job description, he was not equipped, like I was saying, to handle security compared to other individuals that went on vacation. And that was the perfect time to strike the museum. Again, don't do a crime, folks. But if you're going to do a crime, know who's there or not there. Yeah, you, <laughs> you pick the right time. Yeah, <laughs> pick the right time. <laughs> Hilarious. So on the Friday night of the weekend, which would have been September 1st, four intoxicated men were denied entry at basically the local county tavern downtown uh, because they clearly were already too wasted. They were a little rowdy, whatever. But the incident that happened is because they were denied, they set the bar on fire out of rage. (laughs) Okay, calm down. (laughs) There's a lot of things happening. Unfortunately, this fire ended up killing 37 people. (gasps) It was the deadliest fire in the city over 45 years. Oh my God. In addition to that, the Canadian national hockey team lost to the Soviet Union national team 7 to 3 at the Montreal Forum. Canada's having a time. It was it was like their <laughs> apocalypse, all these things happening at once. Because uh, again, you know, especially with the Canadian team, that was a shock to many because hockey was and still their national sport. And yeah. they were they were going against the Soviet Union. Uh, it was part of like their playoff series, which was set for Monday when the heist took place. So all these things happened on fucking Friday. <laughs> oh my god! That's the heist so is weird. taking place Monday. No one was like, "There's too many, sh- there's too much shit going on here." <laughs> no. Okay. So right after midnight passed. On the morning of September 4th, three unidentified men gathered in front of the museum and they made their way to the western wall of the building. One of them was able to climb up a tree and was able to access the roof where he was able to find a ladder to let the other two up. They were able to find an opening in the skylight 
that was covered <laughs> in a plastic sheet where some renovations were being made and they used the nylon rope to slide into the museum without setting off any alarms. No shit. Is this enough Mission Impossible for you? Yep. <laughs> this is like Mission Impossible. This is like Pink Panther. This is everything yep. right here. Yep. Yeah, Pink Panther. <laughs> I climbed a tree. That was an old tree. It was a big tree that he climbed to get all the way up there to get the ladder down. That's nuts. Mm, yeah. And your skylight just happens to be under construction and all these other things. They knew that. They knew. They had to. <laughs> Definitely. I, I Again, I feel like the stars aligned for them in a way. Again, all these things were happening, the game and other stuff. They must have known that the head of PR or whatever was doing security. They had to have known that. They must have been feeling well, really invincible. Feels like- it took 12 years to kind of plan yeah. this to all be perfect. Well, that's, you know gosh, I mean? <laughs> well, that's even a funnier part because it's like they probably planned this and then those other two crucial things happened that I mentioned. And they were like, well, we didn't plan this, but wow, someone must perfect. really someone up there must really want us to rob this place. Right. Is that the, right. <laughs> the gist? It's so crazy. After they were able to get into the museum, they found one of the three guards on duty walking to the kitchen to make himself a cup of tea. With that said, the thieves got his attention by firing a pump action shotgun into the ceiling and they made him lie down on the ground. Oh, fuck. (laughs) I'm not here to tell people how to do their crimes, folks. Again, I say don't do crime. But if I were to do crime, you've already (laughs) executed your 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 execution into breaking in was good. Perhaps you should have brushed up on the tactfulness of, <laughs> right. of the of the heist aspect, like the tactfulness of like what to do with guards or hostages. Like you've already snuck in there quietly. Did I really need to shoot a pump action shotgun into the air until you lay on the right. floor? Couldn't I, right. couldn't we have just walked behind you while you've made that tea and duct tape your ass to the floor? Just tap you and you see like one of us holding a shotgun on the shoulder and we're like, just get on the floor there and take the tea right. and drink it. But no. I mean, don't do crime, folks. Yeah. But if you were, maybe get Justin to be your partner because he sounds oh. like he's got this shit. <laughs> oh my gosh. So <laughs> ridiculous. So that, that happened. But startled by the noise, the two other guards made their way to the kitchen area where they were overpowered by the thieves. And all three of the guards were tied up, brought to the lecture hall. From there, okay. one of the robbers kept watch over the guards while the other two proceeded to remove all of the paintings, jewelry, and figurines. All of them? All of them. You heard correctly. Oh. All, all of, of them. them. Oh, remove shit. all of them. <laughs> <laughs> they brought them down okay. to the shipping department of the museum. And they left through one of those like panel doors, like the Okay. Yeah, yeah like a like a yeah. garage door, probably. Yeah, because okay. they couldn't take everything through the skylight. I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Didn't you say this is one of the largest museums because of the amount the of space. stuff they have there? I did. I did state that. And they took everything? We're going to get oh. there for a moment. <laughs> I also remember in the back history I gave, I stated how it took like 15 years before people started donating money to the museum and, right? and things. So they had the largest space. But see, now that begins to be the question. You had the largest amount of space. Did you truly fill it out to the way that you needed? Or did you just have stuff scattered? Are you like the American Dream Mall in New Jersey where you're now the largest mall in the world, but literally. But there's five fucking stores. Yeah. In there. Yeah. Are you one of those? <laughs> Are you one of those? I was there recently. This is why I had to say that and get it off my chest. But when they left the museum through one of those side entrances, they set off one of the alarms right before they fled the scene. Idiots. (laughs) They then ditched the truck and took what they could on foot, leaving around half of their take behind in the vehicle that is so stupid (laughs) how how did you get so far into planning that you were like we're gonna climb a tree i know this thing is open we're gonna do this shit with the guards put them in this other room we're gonna take everything out and then we never thought about finishing you guys physically took every single painting every single figurine every single piece of jewelry Out of the museum. That in itself (laughs) took some fucking time. Yes, yes. Everything so far seems like you've had a plan. Like, as Lisa said, you got this plan must have been set in motion for like decades. And we we didn't account for setting off an alarm or we didn't 
Ah, uh, so <laughs> yeah, they set that fucking alarm oh off. They God. ditched the truck. They were only able to get away on foot with half the things that they took out. So they got 18 different paintings that were from European artists. That's a range. lot of paintings for three people to carry. It is. And it gets crazier. <laughs> so they... <laughs> They got away with 18 <laughs> paintings. Picture one of them running like this. Just all just all the paintings lined up. They oh, clearly shit. had to have some endurance, too, because, again, it's 18. So you had to keep running back and forth to get that. And it's not just paintings that you ended up taking. So you got the 18 different pairs that were from European artists, like ranging from the 17th to 19th century, Jesus. along with 38 pieces of jewelry and figurines. <laughs> OK, so I'm fucked up because in my head. <laughs> They took everything all in one shot. There's no going back and forth. They got 17 necklaces on. They they could have. You're absolutely Figurines right. Figurines in all their pockets. Well, that's the thing. I That's why I feel like they had to at least go back one more time because figurines are such fragile things. And Delicate, and they're, yeah. They're, I don't know how to say it. It's impractically shaped. Like you, It's not like you can shove pockets full of figurines because they're just – Random designs and random shapes. Oh You're God. either going to stab yourself. In one pocket. They're going to smack yeah. on each other and break. And They're going to stab or break. Yeah, or even I mean, if you put one in your pocket and you have, you know, large thighs such as myself, if I'm trying to run with a painting in my hand already, <laughs> the figurine's probably going to snap in the pocket. So Yes. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> Uh, oh my god large thighs like myself uh, 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 oh listen, my god you I, broke me i have uh. giant quads on it's fine but um <laughs> i listen you gotta you have to own these things but um <laughs> all of that fucking shit those mm-hmm. stolen goods Everything that they managed to take, I'm only counting the worth of everything they took. Not including the other half of the I'm stuff. not including the other half that is okay. now sitting in an abandoned truck. <laughs> right. But the half of that they managed to get away with. Those stolen goods were worth over $2 million at the time. This was 1972. Do we know what it adjusted for inflation? I, I, I have not looked at the adjustment okay, for inflation. I would imagine it's it's at least like up to 10 mil. And that $2 okay. million was U.S. that I... And how much money was it? $2 million. $2 million? Yeah. Just over $14 million. Damn. I said 10, but yeah, over 14. Okay. Damn. And, and you know what's crazy? Even with inflation, that's still not the the most expensive heist in history. Right. Maybe one day I'll cover that one. $2 million, and they only took half the things back then. Huh. All right. So back at the museum, uh, one of the guards was able to free himself around three in the morning, and he called the PR director that was in charge of security <laughs> to inform him of what and that happened. that guy woke up, put his glasses <laughs> on, and was like, what's the matter? I don't... Pretty much. And I, literally, he, he then called the police, and they arrived on the scene not long after along with the museum's curator of uh, decorative arts, Ruth Jackson. She was not happy, I'm sure. They found broken portrait frames and smashed glass displays all around the museum. So again, these guys systematically shattered every frame, took the time to take every painting out, neatly roll it, protect it, whatever. And they also, they, they literally took everything out of that museum. Right, but it's not like they took the frame. They didn't just take yeah, the yeah. shit off the wall. They yeah. cut them out of the frames and rolled them. They, yeah. Oh, and they that's like time shattered. consuming. That's what I'm saying. They were there for a long time, and clearly you wow. had this planned out to an extent. So for for what to happen with the alarm and you to now have to only take half of that. That's crazy. They just looked at him like, Jerry, what the <laughs> fuck, Jerry? Why'd you touch that door? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, in some of my past heist, I, I, I told you how some of the museums, you know, their flaw was security, which was a well-known thing. This here, I mean, this museum at the time had the proper security. It had proper glass encasement. Technology wasn't very advanced in the 70s at all, especially compared to now. So for yeah. whatever they did have, it was good. Yeah, it was it was pretty solid. Could you imagine being Ruth, whoever the fuck? And she's like the one who curated all of this stuff. <laughs> and she's adding pieces. This is probably like her baby. And she walks in and she's like. She's just what? walking on that glass. Yeah, no, I, I would imagine. Holding onto her face like everything is gone. Everything is gone. It was all around the museum. And it was even along the route that like the thieves took to enter the museum. So if picture, if you will, they managed to take everything 
they then attempted to try to go out that skylight. It didn't work out. So now they're re-walking over all that broken glass, going to the shipping department downstairs and slipping out. So it's just a never-ending trail of debris, broken frames. Well, you know, and that's probably it right there. You probably just said it, why it didn't work. Because they assumed they can get all that shit back out of the skylight. They never had to open a door. And they were just like, well, now we can't. So either we leave with nothing (laughs) or we just go out and set the alarm off. Like, those are our only two choices. Crazy. (laughs) So, but you're right. They were like, there's no way we can keep going up and down this nylon rope, probably. That was their, their mentality about it. Yeah. A day after the incident, you know, they publicized the heist through a news conference that made it known nationwide and in the U.S., basically alerting all authorities in both countries to look out for the robbers because they thought this could become an international thing. So the news of the heist was quickly overshadowed. Yet another random calamity, if you will, that has been happening with this whole thing. Uh, The reason why the heist was overshadowed in the news is because at that time, the Munich massacre had happened the very next day where Palestinian terrorists had killed 11 Israeli athletes and a German police officer at the Summer Olympics that year. Wow. So the local authorities continued with their investigation and learned from their interviews with the guards that two of the robbers spoke French and one spoke English. Investigators saw okay. similarities between that heist and another art robbery in, Mo- in the mm-hmm. Montreal area that happened just five days before the Skylight Caper. So it was a practice run. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and in this one that happened five days prior to the Skylight Caper, it was a group of thieves, which they now feel that were the same thieves, broke into a summer home and stole fifty thousand dollars worth of paintings. Oh shit! Did they go in through a skylight, Justin? <laughs> No, there was, no, there was okay. no skylight this time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Imagine they were like, all right, let's let's practice. We could just call this the summer home caper. Okay. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, witnesses from the previous robbery said that the paintings were stolen by a group of three robbers, two of whom spoke French, one that spoke English. So it now matches okay. the skylight caper, right. what the guard said. Early on in the investigation, they also suspected that a group of students from a nearby fine arts school, École des Beaux Arts de Montreal, were the ones that conducted the art heist. That was the name of the, the art school, by the way, that I butchered. I got you. But, okay. It was rough, but okay. I got you. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Equale de Beaux. Equale de Beaux Arts. Yeah. There have been several instances. <laughs> Forgive me, people. French. You don't speak French. Can't I don't French. speak French. I don't. I, I don't read it. I don't speak it. It. T- it took me like two weeks to learn it when I had to say a few lines once for a show. Disclaimer. Disclaimer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there have been several instances where students from the mostly French speaking school had been asked to leave the museum after sticking around past closing time. So as a result, they kept five of the students who they suspected were involved under 24 hour surveillance for two weeks to see if they could find any leads on the investigation. And they got nothing. However, yeah, they were they were unsuccessful and decided to drop them as suspects in the investigation after they were unable to find anything. Yeah. Holy shit. That's crazy. So they were, the, again, they were just reaching. Huh. They're like, well, this art school and people stayed here late. Well, these are the same people that kept coming late. Let's watch them for two weeks and nothing. Hmm. They found oh, nothing. That's so interesting. Um, okay. So some people believed, which maybe you're leaning towards a little bit. I was always leaning from towards this from the jump. I'm on this side here. Some people believe that the heist was an inside job because of the way the robbers knew that most of the important staff members in charge of security were on vacation that weekend and how they wouldn't set off any alarms going through the skylight. They were able to complete the heist in less than two hours and only took paintings that were small enough for them to carry out with the truck, which would be quicker to sell. Like like from the truck, everything that they took out of there, they only ran away with the smallest stuff. It was picky choosy. They didn't just pick whatever. Yeah, yeah. The analysts say they probably did that because they figured it was easier to get those things and sell it. But uh, despite this theory, they've never been able to find enough evidence to prove that someone on the inside was helping the robbers out. And eventually they abandoned the possibility of thieves having some inside help. One of the missing paintings 
was eventually recovered in a locker at the Montreal Central Station when the thieves oh, tried shit. to negotiate a ransom for $500,000. But oh. authorities were unable to catch the robbers despite their efforts to track them down. Yes, you heard who, correctly. Who else did we have? <laughs> who, uh, our, my boy. What's his name? Fucking put things in a locker in a train station. Tim Allen. Yes, it's like Tim out Allen. of a, it's like out of a ridiculous. It always movie. comes down to the locker. <laughs> Don't trust the locker. That's old timey thing. Don't put shit in a locker because that means the cops coming. <laughs> but see, Tim, Tim Allen got caught. The, these people right. managed to look at the audacity on this. They were like. Oh, it's been enough time. No one's caught us. So, yes, we're going to play a little game. This ransom mm. here. We're going to return this painting if you give us half a million. And no, the cops were there. It was probably too much heat. They left and the cops probably searched like, all it. of that and got the, the painting. So mm. to this day, they have yet to identify the thieves. They haven't even recovered any of the remaining missing paintings. I am fascinated by people who commit massive crimes like this and are never caught. I don't know how people live. Well, like the story I just told you, right? The Jen Shaw story. So for like the last three years, she's been saying she's innocent, knowing she was guilty the whole time. That's got to take a toll. I'm not just thinking about it. Like, how does she not have 50 ulcers? That's got to take a a mental and emotional toll. She probably does. It's like a physical fucking toll. You know, like the amount of stress, like those guys are walking around for whatever the rest of their lives, knowing that they could just turn around and be arrested anytime because they've committed this insane crime. Yeah. uh, You know that I'm no criminal because I, (laughs) my anxiety is way too bad. (laughs) I don't need to add, add insult to injury. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, again, I, I would have to look into 72. I don't know if the whole art registry existed back then. Because, you know, now right. if you steal these paintings, like right. they go on a list. You everyone's looking. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing to live with that your whole life. I mean, that's got to take a toll. It's very intense. But, you know, some people have theories. And again, one of my theories was it could have been inside job and they just weren't informed about the alarm downstairs. Also, it could have just been the same fucking people from that 1960 attempt we will never know Hmm. we'll never know i love it so (laughs) that's the skylight caper (laughs) i love that story so i have an update from our last episode oh that i meant to talk about in the beginning but i guess i'll talk about it now so we talked about in the last episode the black dahlia case right and we were talking about um hodel the dad <clears throat> on the phone and talking about his his secretary that she can't talk because she's dead now too and how did she die remember you were right. asking I fucking found out how she died how did she die I found her death certificate and she died from a barbiturate overdose they called it suicide at 27 yo he fucking killed her <laughs> he drugged her he killed her he killed her Justin <gasps> And that's what I was saying before, because I was like, what happened to her? He had to have done something to her. She died. She was 27 of a barbiturate overdose. If he can get the Black Dahlia to eat shit before he murdered her, he can get this woman to eat a bunch of pills. Yeah. I even stand more firm on the idea that it was Hodel. I, I agree. I agree with that. So I just wanted to make sure that I put that, that in there. Wild. And another disclaimer. Last week I said I was going to do the story that Tracy recommended. Tracy, our listener in Ireland. This wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> Shaw Liberty was not the one she recommended. I've been working on it. I'm just so out of the loop with the way to say names and terminology and things that I want to like really dedicate more time to it. I have it mostly written, but I just wanted to put that out there. This is not the story she recommended, okay. but it will come. It, it will, <laughs> it it will come. And when it comes, we'll, we'll be sure to like lead off yes. with the recording the we'll be like there. hey <laughs> we'll, we'll start off but uh also patreon uh because i just realized now we haven't talked about it at this episode yep. but yes yes <laughs> head on over to our patreon if you would like to support crime of the arts head over to patreon.com backslash crime of the arts podcast we have two tiers for you the first tier is five dollars a month and that is the peak behind the curtain tier and at that level you get video recordings of us in the studio acting fools 
showing our true opinions about how we feel all over our faces. And you get a card. And if you decide to up the ante and go to the don't do crime folks level, that is $10 a month, you will be entered into merch giveaways and you get the card and some cool stickers. And of course, you get these videos too. And we also want to give you more content. So let us know what you want. And maybe we can, you know, deliver we just don't want to give you something you exactly <laughs> and, and again too the cool thing about whichever tier you pick like lisa said you'll get to see us and our reactions you know the podcast when you're listening to it through whatever streaming service you choose to you know you're hearing the edited version per se but when you're watching these video yes. clips you are watching it unedited good bad and good, the ugly bad, there's the no ugly. editing so uh you know it's also to some people apparently very comedic so <laughs> hopefully. hopefully but i think it's yeah. funny um yeah so i don't edit the videos the videos you get raw in the studio talking about how we'll delete that part yeah we, we want you guys to feel like the real actual experience so like it's a very mm-hmm. intimate thing and only our patrons can be a part of that you know <laughs> I just ordered some hats and t-shirts that are going to be part of the giveaway. And there's going to be a few things that you have to do in order to be entered. So the t-shirt and the hat giveaway is going to need to write us a review and then shoot us a message on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, letting us know that you did that review and that's you. And that would get you into the running to win either a hat or or a shirt. We're going to send them international wherever you Ooh. are. So please, once I get the images, I will put them up, but they're pretty fun. And yeah, engage with us. We love talking to you guys and let us know what you think. I was cracking up watching the video from last month because you could see that my cogs were not like turning <laughs> sharply through all of the day quill that I had in my system. <laughs> and I had like massive revelations during the <laughs> During the recording, but I was cracking up myself. I was like, oh my God, there's so much decongestant in my face. This was a great episode. I really enjoyed it. It was. A <laughs> little, little easier. This was a little easier. It, it was, just, it, yeah, it was a chill episode. A lighter, lighter I'll episode. Have to, yeah. I know. Usually we're like dark and darker. No sexual assault and murder. We got fraud and robbery. <laughs> it's just a little, little lighter today. <laughs> Shawtastic All and right, uh, yeah, the um, skylight caper. <laughs> Shawtastic. Is that what it was? Was that the phrase? Shemazing. Oh, shamazing. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Shawtastic is so. You can funny. have that for free, Shaw. Oh, I don't. I don't know. Thanks. 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 <laughs> When you look back at the history of the creative arts, it takes a lot of darkness to create the light the arts bring to the world. Thanks for joining us this week. And if you enjoyed our conversation, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and head over to Apple Podcasts to rate and review. Please check out our sources listed in the episode notes. They're amazing. And you can find us on all the social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and you can head on over to crumbofthearthspodcast.com. We're looking forward to having you back next week. Until next time, peace out, everybody. Peace out.